Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's PCS IBS seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Rahul Nandkishore, and I would like to invite our scientific host uh, Dario to introduce our speaker. Please, Dario. Okay, uh, thank you, Tilen. So yeah, it's a great pleasure to have today Rahul Nandkishore from, from Colorado. Uh, let me introduce the speaker. I mean, uh, he got his PhD uh, from, from MIT in 2012 with the thesis about quantum many body physics in single and bilayer graphene. After that, he moved to Princeton, where uh, he stayed as a postdoctoral fellow for three years. And since then, he moved to Colorado, Boulder, where essentially, if I understood correctly, he remained, uh, he's still there. And uh, I mean, he moved as an assistant professor and currently is an associate professor in physics. So his research interests are rather broad. And I would say that it's probably fair to say that his main contribution has been in many body localization, maybe. I mean, he's mostly well known for, for his contribution in many body localization. But more generally, I mean, his interest uh, is mostly about, let's say, new phases of quantum matters. And for example, today he's going to talk about fracton dynamics. So Raul, please, you can go. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, glad to tell you today about some of my work on fracton dynamics. Uh, I have listed here the like, various papers uh, which comprise the work I'll be talking about. Uh, so look, in, in terms of motivation, you know, I'm a condensed matter theorist. And to my mind, the key thing about condensed matter theory is it's about searching for new phases of matter. And now in equilibrium, the possibilities for what sorts of phases of matter we can have are fairly well understood. But non-equilibrium systems can support qualitatively new kinds of phases of matter with no equilibrium analog. This is something we pointed out a while ago, but you, know, you can have familiar types of ordering in new settings, and you can also have new sorts of phases, and time crystals are the most famous example of that. Uh, but the key ingredient for getting new phases of matter in a non-equilibrium setting is you need systems to be somehow non-ergodic, because if they're ergodic, they'll go to thermal equilibrium, and eventually you'll be described by equilibrium statistical mechanics. So how can you break ergodicity? There's two canonical answers. One is integrability, and the other is many-body localization. Uh, now, both of these actually involve infinitely many conservation laws. Uh, so for integrability, there's sort of infinitely many explicit conservation laws. For many body localization, there are infinitely many emergent conservation laws. And if you perturb the system, then you change what quantities are conserved, but you still have infinitely many conservation laws. Uh, but are there other routes to ergodicity breaking that don't rely on either integrability or many body localization? Uh, and two you know, topics which are very topical, and I'll make mention them both in the talk, are quantum many body scars and fractions. Uh, and fractons will be the main thing that I'll talk about. So you know, what are fractons? Well, fractons are a new kind of quantum phase of matter. Uh, originally, they were inspired by quantum information and written down in three space dimensions, but now we know that there's nothing you know, magic about three space dimensions. Uh, the key thing about fractons is that they exhibit fractionalized immobility. So there are excitations which are either totally immobile under their own dynamics, or they can move only in certain directions. Uh, and it's easiest to illustrate this with exactly solvable models. Uh, and the nicest exactly solvable model uh, that I know of here is the X cube model. Uh, so X cube is a model uh, which describes spin half variables which live on the links of a cubic lattice. And it's a stabilizer code, meaning it contains two sorts of terms all, and all the terms commute with each other. There are the A's and the B's and the A involves a product uh, of X operators uh, on all of the links that frame an elementary cube. Whereas the B says, well, you pick a vertex and you pick a plane that defines you know, four links which connect to that vertex in that plane. And you take the product of Zs around uh, those four links. Uh, and you know, these sorts of terms, the A's and B's have zero, two or four spins in common. So they commute. Uh, and so you can simultaneously diagonalize all of them. And the ground state is you give all of these stabilizer operators you know, eigenvalue one. Uh, open boundary conditions that uniquely specifies it with periodic boundary conditions or some left over, but that's basically how it works. Uh, and there's a gap to elementary excitations, which means if you perturb a little bit, you know, the sort of properties of the system are still robust. 
Uh, and one interesting thing that I want to mention is now let's let's suppose we act with a Z operator on a single link. So if you act with the Z operator on a single link, the B operators are made of Zs, so it commutes with those. The A operators are made of Xs, so it anti-commutes with every A operator which shares this link, which means it flips the sign of you know, these four A operators. Each of these four cubes previously had eigenvalue plus one under the A operators. Now they have eigenvalue minus one. These are excited. Now let's imagine acting with two Zs. Yeah? So the two cubes on the one end, they're anti-commutated with once, so they're unhappy. The two cubes in the middle, you have two anti-commutations, so they're happy again. But then there's two more cubes here, which are unhappy, which are anti-commutated with once. Now let's suppose we act with a whole membrane of these operators. So everywhere in the interior or along the edges, uh, you flip the sign of the cube operator an even number of times, so it's happy. But at the corners, you flip it an odd number of times and it's unhappy. So if you act with a membrane of Z operators, you end up making a single unhappy cube excitation at each corner. And this unhappy cube excitation is you know, what's called a fracton. Uh, and the point is there's no way to move it uh, while doing purely local dynamics. So if you act with Z operators anywhere nearby, you can move this cube, but you'll end up creating additional excitations. The only way to actually end up moving one of these cube operators without creating additional excitations is to expand or contract or otherwise deform this entire membrane. Uh, but that's an extremely non-local operation. Yeah? So you, you cannot move these cube operators uh, by doing only local dynamics, at least not without creating additional excitations. So that's one example. There's other kinds of fracton models. There's Haas code, which involves you know, spin halves on the vertices of a cubic lattice and true spin halves in every vertex. We won't go into details. The important thing with Haas code is that you move these excitations by essentially creating fractal patterns uh, of operators. And the energy barrier to creating this fractal pattern actually grows logarithmically with the linear size of the pattern that you make. We'll come, you know, Sorry, we'll just, do... just a curiosity. I mean, they this, let's say, fractons enter uh, I mean, can be, let's say, thought only in terms of stabilizer codes? No, no, or... no, 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 not at all, yeah. Uh, I mean, the stabilizer codes are how people first discovered them. Uh, and okay. they're nice because they're exactly solvable. So there's nothing to argue about, sure. right? You can make statements and you can prove them. Uh, but you should think of these stabilizer code Hamiltonians as sort of fixed point Hamiltonians. So you could have, you know, there's fracton phases, you know, in some renormalization mm -hmm. group sense, there's some big basin of attraction, Know, all sorts of Hamiltonians, which are ultimately in the same phase. And like the fixed point Hamiltonian looks like the stabilized reports. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so now let me show you a complementary way to think about these fracton models. Uh, and that's in terms of gauge theories. So we're familiar with gauge theories like electromagnetism uh, and gauge theories have Gauss law constraints. So a Gauss law constraint might be something like div E is rho where rho is charge. And this sort of Gauss law constraint implies a conservation law. And in this case, it implies the conservation law for charge. So if you take the charge in a volume, you can use Gauss law to write this as a volume integral of a divergence. And then divergence here and return this into a surface integral. And if you fix the electric field on the surface then the charge in that volume must be conserved. Now, there's something that Michael Pretko, who was my postdoc, uh, figured out is that suppose you consider a sort of generalized gauge theory where the gauge fields are not vectors, instead they're tensors, and specifically they're symmetric tensors. Yeah? So if you write down you know, gauge theories of symmetric tensors, uh, they'll turn out to have sort of generalized Gauss laws. So the electric field is now a, a symmetric tensor. Gauss law looks something like di dj eij is rho. And this encodes an additional conservation law. So if you look at the dipole moment in the volume, x times rho, you can use Gauss law to write this as x times the double derivative of e. And now you can use integration by parts to turn this into a volume integral of a divergence. And now you can use divergence theorem to say that if you fix the electric field on the boundary, then not only does the charge inside that volume have to be conserved, but in fact, the dipole moment of that volume also has to be conserved, yeah? So only processes that conserve dipole moment are allowed. Okay. So um, I mean, maybe uh, maybe a silly question. I mean, uh, when you when you talk about symmetric rank two tensors, yeah. one thing about let's say the metric and gravity. Yeah. So is this 
uh, I mean, are these fractals? Uh, Gravity no? is not a fracton theory, no. Uh, but okay. it because isn't probably you... not every symmetric rank two tensor theory is a fracton theory. Ah, okay, uh, okay, yeah. But some of them are. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, the thing about this is that if you have this generalized Gauss law, you have conservation law on the okay. multiple moment of okay. charge. If you have a charge sitting here, it cannot move. Yeah, right. If it moves, it changes the dipole moment, and dipole moment sure. is a quantity. Uh, so, you now this conservation law on the dipole moment it gives you for free this sort of fracton property that elementary charges cannot move. But if you had a plus charge and a minus charge, then those can move freely, right? Because the motion of this dipole doesn't change the dipole moment. Uh, so you get this property, this sort of key fracton property that if you have isolated charges, they cannot move. Okay? And something that Isaac Kim and Zhang Wan Ha spotted you know, six years ago is that if you have you know, a single isolated fracton in the system, it just, it's totally immobile. So even though the Hamiltonian is translation invariant, the state will forever preserve a memory of its initial condition, namely it has a fracton sitting there. So in that sense, you could say it has localization, but it's not really many body localization because it's just a one or a finite number of excitations in a thermodynamically large system. So what happens if you move to non-zero energy density? So again, you know, let's start by moving to non-zero energy density and these stabilizer codes, which you know, have the virtue that they're like, very concrete. You can calculate things exactly. Uh, so you know, let's say you have some finite density of excitations in the stabilizer code. Some are these sort of single unhappy cube excitations, which are immobile. And then there's also excitations like two unhappy cubes close together, and those are actually mobile excitations. Yeah? And now what you have is you can have a process, which I guess I've sketched here, where this unhappy cube excitation essentially absorbs a mobile excitation and ends up moving. Yeah? But the only problem is that these mobile excitations, you know, their bandwidth is set by how strongly you've perturbed the stabilizer code, uh, whereas the energy gap is given by uh, is it, sort of order one. The energy gap is much bigger than the bandwidth of these mobile excitations. Uh, so, you know, so you know, it's at least apparently non-trivial that you have these mobile excitations with tiny band, uh, bandwidth. And how can they allow, uh, you know, excitations with some massive band, you know, with some massive mobility gap to move? So this is a sort of problem that we actually sort of studied at length in the many body localization context. Uh, so we can just borrow those analyses and apply them and, you know, since this is really just a warm up to the main talk, I don't want to go into the details, but the bottom line is that you know, at non-zero temperature, non-zero energy density, uh, these fracton excitations actually acquire a non-zero mobility, but the mobility is exponentially suppressed uh, essentially you know, by, the, by the rareness uh, of the mobile excitation. Uh, so that's in the X cube model. If we worked with the Haas code model, then you know, Haas code had this property that the energy barrier actually grew logarithmically with distance. Uh, so that means the further you want to move the fractons, the slower they move, uh, you know, because it costs more and more energy with every subsequent move. And this translates into subdiffusion. Uh, and it also means that, well, sort of subdiffusive up until the fractons find each other, at which point they become immobile. How far do they have to go? Well, they have to go to a distance that's exponential in temperature. The energy barrier is logarithmic in that spacing. So the energy barrier is power law and temperature. And this turns out to give an equilibration time, which follows a super arena scaling. Uh, so the equilibration time diverges as t goes to zero, you know, uh, but it diverges you know, faster than an exponential. It diverges as exponential and one over temperature squared. And these properties, I mean, in some sense, you know, it looks weird in some other sense, it's very strongly reminiscent of kinetically constrained models of classical glasses. Uh, and kinetically constrained models are sort of attempts to describe classical glass, where you just put in some constraints on what dynamical moves are allowed. And these sort of kinetically constrained models are known to exhibit glassy dynamics. Uh, and in fact, no, the, no. So here we're getting the same sort of dynamical rules that you would get in a kinetically constrained model of classical glass. It's just they're emerging naturally from Hamiltonian dynamics. And you sort of write down a Hamiltonian, you ask what the dynamics gives you, uh, and you get what looks like you know, kinetically constrained models of classical glass. Okay, so this is you know, essentially the warm up act. Uh, no, you have these fracton models, especially these stabilizer code models, they're translationally invariant, exactly solvable. They have these nice properties that the fracton, that the mobility of the elementary excitations is suppressed. 
potentially super exponentially fast in temperature. And you could have in principle the subdiffusion up into long time scales. Yeah. But at the end of the day, everything is still ergodic, right? You sort of wait long enough, things go to thermal equilibrium. Uh, and now we come to the real part of the talk, which is that actually, you know, if you take sort of some inspiration to what we you know, learned from fractons, you can actually find much richer physics, including true ergodicity breaking. But if you want to do that, you want to move away from these Z2 type sort of stabilizer code models to models with true U1 conservation rules. Yeah? So that's what I'll tell you about now. Uh, so essentially, if you consider sort of U1 models with fracton type conservation laws, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute, then this actually gives rise to localization. So just a reminder, a conventional Anderson localization, many body localization, it requires strong disorder. It also requires perfect isolation. So you, you cannot be subject to noise or any heat path. Uh, but with fracton type conservation laws, what we can get is we can get localization in translationally invariant systems. So no strong disorder. And we can also get localization in systems with noise. So there's no, not even energy conservation. Yeah? And moreover, the results are rigorous. So you can like, prove things exactly. Yeah? And in fact, I'll even, and the proof is simple enough that I can just show it to you in this talk. Uh, but the key ingredient is that you, know, you require additional conservation laws and specifically you know, the minimal set of conservation laws, which is sufficient, it's not unique, but the minimal set, which is sufficient, uh, is charge and dipole. So if I say that I conserve charge, like U1 charge, and I conserve dipole moment, and you know, this is sort of motivated by the fracton theories we saw before, then just these two global conservation laws plus spatial locality suffice to give localization but even in the absence of disorder and in the absence of energy conservation. Yeah? And you now you may think, hey, what's the big deal? You already said if you have a single charge, it can't move about if you have dipole conservation. Yeah? But I'm not restricting myself to having a single charge. I could have, you know, if I have dipoles plus charge and minus charge, those can move about freely. Yeah? But what I will explain is that you know, in a very well-defined sense, the system is still localized. Like these dipoles actually cannot move about even though naively it would seem that the conservation laws allow them to. And you may also think that you know, these conservation laws seem very artificial, but actually they're not. There's multiple natural experimental realizations, which I'll talk about. And the simplest of those is just you have ultra cold atoms in a tilted potential. Yeah? And the potential tilt couples to center of mass. So if you have a strong potential tilt and energy conserving dynamics, then the center of mass can't change. And that's like saying the dipole moment can't change. So that's one example of an experimental realization. There are others. Okay, so now let's just start by writing down a well-defined model. So it's sort of everything is simplest in one dimension. Uh, so we could you know, the sort of simplest non-trivial model is we have a one-dimensional spin one chain yeah? uh, and the U1 charge is spin Z. Yeah? So U1 charge on each side takes three possible values, plus one, plus minus one, one zero. Yes. <coughs> Uh, and the dipole moment is defined in the obvious way. It's just the position weighted charge. And now what we want is that we want, no, we want dipole moment to be, we want to impose dipole conservation, which means that a single charge cannot move because that would change the dipole moment, but dipoles can move freely. And what we can also have is this sort of process. So you, know, you could interpret this process either as a charge moves left and, in, and emits a dipole to the right, or a charge moves right and emits a dipole to the left. And you know, in either case, the dipole moment is conserved and so is the charge. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what you can do is like, the simplest way to implement this is you can just write down a quantum circuit model, right? So you have some state, uh, the dynamics is generated by some unitary, uh, by some local unitaries, right? These local unitaries, you could view them as gates in a quantum circuit, or you could view it as a trotterization or sort of Suzuki trotter decomposition of Hamiltonian dynamics, yeah? But the sort of, the unitaries that generate the dynamics, they're, you know, they're local, so they only act on a finite number of sites, and they're constrained to respect these conservation laws, uh, meaning they have to conserve charge and dipole, yeah? which means that essentially these unitary operators, they have to be block diagonal. They only act within the single charge and dipole symmetry sector. Yeah? And here's an example of a block diagonal of operator. Uh, this is for the case where you're acting on three sites at a time. You could also consider acting on four sites or five sites or six sites. Then you get more and more complicated block diagonal operators. The important thing though is just that you're acting on a finite number of sites with each unitary 
and you're conserving charge and dipole. And now you ask about the time dynamics that's generated by this sort of time evolution. So you know, time dynamics is always sort of diagonal on the basis of symmetry sectors. So here we have two conserved quantities, charge and dipole. So you would expect that whatever charge and dipole symmetry sector you stay, start in, you stay there. Yeah. So your obvious guess might be that the, the long time steady state will be just some equal weight superposition over every state in that symmetry sector. Right? This would be sort of uh, you know, ergodic ergodicity with respect to a symmetry sector in the way we usually understand it. And if you consider starting with a charge that's peaked in one place and you run the dynamics, you might expect that you, know, you would end up in a uniform weight superposition over all states, which looks like these two plots on the left. It basically looks flat over the whole system. But now you actually do the time dynamics and you see something which looks like what's shown on the right. In fact, you don't end up with uniform charge distribution over the whole system. It spreads out a little bit and then it stops. Yeah. Uh, so it actually looks as if you have charge localized. It's not spreading over the whole system. Uh, and you know, for the sort of simplest model I gave of three side gates, you can monitor the charge dynamics and you see that you know, even if you have translation invariance, even if you're doing sort of infinite temperature dynamics, even if you're doing stochastic dynamics, so there's not even any energy conservation, still charge is localized. You start off with charge here and it does not spread over the whole system. It does not fully explore the symmetry sector. Now, if you switch to longer range gates, so you consider you know, gates which act on maybe five sites at a time, yeah, uh, then you know, things change. Then if you just pick a random initial condition or if you pick an infinite temperature condition, uh, then the charge does seem to spread, but there's you no. Know, but that's if you pick, you know, if you pick a, a configuration at random from Hilbert space as your initial condition, there's still a subspace that's exponentially large in system size, which exhibits exact and sort of provably exact localization, despite the fact that you could be doing stochastic dynamics, so you don't even have energy conservation. Uh, so this is something we observed in this you know, paper with Pai and Pretko. And the explanation emerged in this later paper with Vedika Kimani and Mike Hermelay. Uh, and well, now let's explain what the story is. Yeah? Uh, so the key ingredients are that we're conserving charge and we're conserving dipole. And the dynamics is generated by operators which have some finite bounded maximum range. Let's call it M. And it doesn't really matter if we're doing quantum circuit evolution or Hamiltonian evolution. All that matters is that the dynamics are generated by operators of finite spatial range and they conserve charge and dipole. Now let's consider a state of the sort I've shown here. So here plus is the state of maximally positive charge and minus is the state of my maximally negative charge. So if I was doing my spin one chain, then plus is SC is plus one and minus is SC is minus one. Yeah. So let's consider a, a configuration which is all pluses, all minuses, all pluses. You know, this is sort of labeled by some pattern of domain walls. And now I've you know, further put in the structure that the domain walls are at least as far apart as M. Yeah? So if the dynamics is generated by gates of range at most M, then the domain walls are at least as far apart as M. Now let's consider you know, how my, what sort of dynamics my operators generate. So every operator or every gate has to act across either zero or one domain walls. Yeah? It can never act across two because the domain walls are further apart than the biggest operator. If it acts across zero domain walls, then it's acting on a state that's locally maximum charge. And there's nothing you can do to that consistent with charge conservation. If it acts across one domain wall, then it's acting on a state that's locally maximum dipole. And again, there's no rearrangement you can make consistent with dipole conservation. Yeah? Which means that this sort of state has to be an exact eigenstate of any quantum dynamics which respects these two conservation laws and spatial locality. Yeah? And you can ask how many states like this are there? Well, it's easy to make a lower bound. So you carve up your system into blocks of size M and each block you can allow to be either you know, all plus or all minus. So that straight away gives you a number of blocks with you know, a number of states, which is exponential in system size. And each of those is a product state in the charge basis. And it has to be an exact eigenstate of any quantum dynamics with these two conservation laws and spatial locality. Now, this is just a lower bound. Its bound is not tight. Now, you can do transfer matrix calculations and you can get exact results for how many such 
exactly localized states there are, but you know, there's a lot of them. Uh, and this, maybe, yeah. I don't know, uh, maybe it's not the relevant question, but suppose that you perturb a little bit this situation in, and right. you add, uh, let's say, a little bit of long range interaction, but just, let's say, a tiny amount. Do right. you de fully destroy this, uh, well, this? Yeah, okay. So now you have to ask, you know, what do you mean by long range, right? So you could say that suppose I, you know, suppose you put in, uh, you know, gates which have range 5 million yeah okay support, right okay uh so it, i can still give you an exponentially many in system volume states which okay. are exact states yeah but now it's sort of system volume measured in units of 5 million mm -hmm. no but suppose that i mean on you you keep all the operators let's say uh of dimension three let's say right. so this is a situation and you add let's say randomly somewhere a gate right. now you right let's so, say this. well okay yeah. so are, are you acting the gate in one place or are you adding, adding it everywhere in so one place let's it say. in one place it's not going to do anything so actually this was the next thing i was going to say so you can I take see. the states and you can deform them so they're not eigenstates anymore, right? You can mess with them in, in, in a compact region of real space, right? Okay. The then is that now you don't have an eigenstate there and you can get some non-trivial dynamics and some mixing in a bounded region of real space. But if you look far away from there, then you're still dealing with eigenstates, yeah? So now what you're doing is you're embedding you know, non blocks with non-trivial dynamics into a system that's otherwise you know, inert. Now, okay. if you added you know, gates with long range tails, so if you gave all the gates you know, exponential tails, let's say, yeah, then strictly speaking, these will not be eigenstates anymore. Like the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the structure that I'm talking about will get melted. But you know, that time scale could be very long. It could be sort of exponentially long if it's exponentially big tails. Yeah. So let's say it's pretty robust, uh, this, uh, this situation, this, let's yeah. say this, uh, yeah. But the sort of rigorous results are for you know bounded. Sure, 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 sure. Big, but it needs to be bounded. Yeah. So yeah, so as I mentioned already, you can insert you know finite sized regions with non-trivial dynamics in there, which means that you know if you look at the structure of Hilbert space, right, it exhibits this dynamical <coughs> structure. Uh, so essentially, look, Hilbert space is always block diagonal uh, by symmetry sector, right? So if you look at the the, the unitary operator which generates time evolution, it's always block diagonal by symmetry sector. But here, within each symmetry sector, it further massively block diagonalizes. Yeah. And it, specifically, it block diagonalizes into exponentially many subblocks. And some of those are one by one. And those are the exact eigenstates that I just showed you. Then there's two by two blocks, not three by three, four by four. There's the full distribution. And in principle, there's two different regimes you could have. So there's the regime where a typical state drawn from Hilbert space sits in a finite size subblock. And there's the case where a typical state drawn from Hilbert space sits in an infinite size subblock. Yeah? And in the former case, typical states drawn from Hilbert space look localized because there's just not that many states they can mix with. And in the latter case, typical states drawn from Hilbert space don't look localized, but you know, but there's still exponentially many states which do look localized. Like there's still an exponentially large localized subspace. The only question is, is it, you know, is it the whole Hilbert space or you know, is it a vanishing fraction of the Hilbert space? So this is closely related to the notion of dynamical fracture which Shirashi and Mori put forward, but in the Shirashi Mori you know, version of dynamical fracture, the sort of fracturing was put in by hand, whereas here it emerges naturally uh, from uh, these two conservation laws. And because it emerges naturally, there's also a natural notion of robustness. It's robust to any perturbations that respect these two conservation laws and spatial locality. Yeah? And it's you know, richer than what we had earlier in the sort of stabilized accord models, mainly because we promote it from Z2 to U1. And when you go from Z2 to U1, you have this sort of much stronger sort of true ergodicity break. You can generalize this to higher dimensions. Yeah, so the simplest way you can generalize to higher dimensions is let's say you can serve charge and dipole and every component of dipole. Yeah, now you can obviously make stripe states, which will be eigenstates, but the stripe states will be, uh, they'll only be exponentially many in system, in system linear size. But actually, you can allow the stripes to roughen. So you can allow the stripes to deform a little bit and they actually remain eigenstates. Uh, and it's a dimensional reduction argument. And you can show that actually in you 
any arbitrary number of dimensions. So if you're on the hypercubic lattice in D dimensions and you consider charge and all components of dipole, then you have exponential and volume states, which are exactly localized. So they're product states and they're exact eigenstates of any dynamics which respects charge conservation, dipole conservation, and spatial locality. Yeah? So this exponential and volume localized subspace is always there in any number of dimensions. And you know, the examples I've been giving are for charge and dipole, but you know, there's other ways to do it. You can put in quadrupole conservation, you have various other conservation laws that you put in. Charge and dipole is just the simplest to visualize. Uh, these conservation laws look somewhat baroque, but actually not. So I already mentioned cold atoms in a potential tilt, right? So the potential tilt couples center of mass. If the potential tilt is very strong, the center of mass can't move. That's like dipole conservation. Uh, and so you should expect to get this sort of ergodicity breaking. And this has been observed both in the Munich group and the Hangzhou group. Uh, it's also a proposed realization in atomic clocks. And you know, there may be other realizations as well. So to summarize what I told you in this part of the talk, uh, when we started, we started with models with discrete conservation laws like these stabilizer code conservation laws. But when we promote to U1, uh, then we actually, you know, so stabilizer code models with the Z2 conservation laws, they had glossy dynamics. But when we promote the U1 conservation laws, then we get true localization in a subspace that's exponentially large in system volume. And this can be rigorously proven. I essentially proved it already in this talk. Yeah, we sort of gave this sort of constructive procedure for making these exact eigenstates. All it requires is it requires these exact conservation laws and it requires strict locality, yeah, and no exponential. And it can be realized in a pre-thermal sort of sense in various experimental systems. Now, just to come back to this, you know, so far I was mostly talking about these small subsectors, these exact eigenstates or finite sized subsectors. I mentioned that there were also these you know, sub-blocks in the unitary matrix, which were very large. If you look within those sub-blocks, the dynamics within those sub-blocks is thermal with respect to the sub-block. Yeah? So you have some sort of sub-region of over space and you, know, you fully explore that sub-region. Of hyperspace. So now if you define thermal equilibrium as being thermal equilibrium within this you know, very large subblock, which nonetheless is not the full Hilbert space, then you do go to thermal equilibrium. But there is still a question to be asked about how you go to thermal equilibrium. Okay? So canonically, you would say that you go the approach to equilibrium in a model with conserved charges should be given by hydrodynamics. Okay? In hydrodynamics, we know how that works. You know, we know negative Stokes, we know diffusion equation. But here, the hydrodynamics we get is different. In fact, you know, you get, it's in a different universality class. In fact, there's infinitely many new universality classes, and all of these exhibit subdiffusion. We saw subdiffusion already earlier in the talk. Uh, but there's a very general and systematic way of understanding these, uh, which is essentially to note that, look, the elementary, if, if we're conserving charge and dipole, then the elementary mobile excitations are dipoles. But if I put a dipole in an electric field, it doesn't experience any force in uniform field. Yeah? So there's no current. So there should be no current response to a uniform field, which means the diffusion constant must vanish. Instead, the dipole current has to be a true index object, which couples to a rank two gauge field. And the continuity equation should look something like what I've written down here. Right? If the dipole current is a two index object, now you have dipoles which are oriented in, let's say, the i direction, and they're moving in the j direction then in order to get things to make sense, you need two derivatives as well to make this continuity equation balance. And you can derive this rigorously via Keldish. Uh, and now all you need to know is you know, how do you get this type of current in terms of you know, gradients of the density? So you can do standard sort of thermodynamic Landau style arguments, which tell you that the dipole current is actually given by the second derivative of the density. So the continuity equation involves two derivatives of the current, and the current involves two derivatives of the density, which means if you put it together, you'll get a diffusion equation which involves four space derivatives. It turns out to involve the square of the Laplacian. And in general, you know, if you say that I conserve charge and also the first n multiple moments of charge, then we get a generalized diffusion equation where the Laplacian is replaced by a higher power of the Laplacian. Yeah? So this corresponds to subdiffusion. If it was, if n was one, which is dipole, then that would be k to the fourth subdiffusion. If it was n is two quadrupole, it'll be k to the sixth subdiffusion, and so on. So there is this infinite family of subdiffusive 
hydrodynamic universality classes, uh, which are essentially given by sort of what multiple conservation rules are you imposing on your theory. Uh, so this you can also realize I mentioned this cold atoms example before. So previously I was talking about cold atoms with a very strong tilt. You can consider cold atoms with a very, you know, with a very weak tilt where you don't have effective localization, uh, but you still have this emergent dipole conservation on long length scales. Uh, so this was observed to give subdiffusive relaxation uh, experiment from Princeton group in 2020. And it has a very clean interpretation in terms of this fractal hydrodynamics. There's also charged two dimensional fluids in the magnetic field. Uh, these were observed to have some diffusion without reference to fractons by such safe group back in 2007, uh, but it can be understood you know, very cleanly in terms of this fractal hydrodynamics. There might be other realizations as well. These are just two that we identified. Uh, okay, so we have this you know, cool physics. Now we could wonder, you know, is there any way to maybe you know, actually test any of this in numerics? Turns out the answer is yes, there is. Uh, the challenge is that if you want to see hydrodynamics, you need to be able to see very large system sizes. Uh, and you, know, you can't do exact diagonalization with very large system sizes. What you can do is this technique we introduced, which we call automaton circuits. So the idea here is you consider a quantum circuit, which maps product states in the charge basis to product states in the charge basis, subject to the appropriate conservation laws and spatial locality. Uh, and this is a dynamics which generates no entanglement in the state basis. Yeah? So it can be efficiently simulated. Nonetheless, if you consider feeding its states that are not product states on the charge basis, then the dynamics looks indistinguishable from hard ion dynamics. Yeah? It's sort of completely generic. But how do you simulate it? Well, you simulate it by Monte Carlo. Uh, so you consider some you know, arbitrary initial state, which is not a product state in the charge basis. You take its projection onto a particular product state and you time evolve that and you can do that time evolution efficiently because there's you know, no entanglement generated in that basis. Yeah? Then you take its projection onto another product state in the charge basis, time evolve that, a third product state, time evolve that, and you keep averaging, right? And you just keep going until you get conversions. It's just a straight Monte Carlo, iterate until convergence. And it works really well and it gives you, you know, a computationally efficient method for simulating these sorts of constrained dynamics in very large systems. Uh, and you know, it, as long as you're not feeding initial states, which are product states in the charge basis, it's, it seems completely generic. So like one way to think about this is it's the operate, like, so you may know that you know, Clifford dynamics can be simulated efficiently, right? And Clifford dynamics, maps, you know, Pauli operate, products of Pauli operators to products of Pauli operators. And so it doesn't generate any entanglement in the operator basis, but still it's a nice toy model for quantum dynamics. Yeah? So this is the state analog of that. So you know, Clifford dynamics doesn't generate entanglement in the operator basis, but it does generate entanglement in the state basis. Automaton dynamics doesn't generate entanglement in a particular state basis, but it does generate entanglement in an operator basis or indeed you know, any other state basis. Uh, and you can use this sort of dynamics to verify you know, subdiffusion. So you get characters or predictions for what like, scaling exponents for relaxation should be, and you can verify them all on you know, and it works. Okay, so to summarize you know, part two of the talk, when fractons do thermalize, the approach to equilibrium is described by hydrodynamics but it's described by hydrodynamics in a very non-standard universality class. And in fact, there's an infinite family of these non-standard universality classes and they all exhibit subdiffusion. And we've also introduced a new numerical technique that's capable of exploring this subdiffusion and it's even been observed in one experiment. Okay. Sorry, uh, perhaps you, 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 you said and I, I, I missed the... <clears throat> Uh, I mean, suppose that I have a generic Hamiltonian, how, yeah. or let's say, um, which uh, features this Hamiltonian should have in order to be well, let's say, simulated by this uh, automaton circuit? No, no. So you cannot simulate a, gen a general Hamiltonian. Right. Uh, so, you know, this is a particular quantum dynamics, which has the property that it has a special basis. And if you but input right. the product state in that special basis, what you get out is a product state in that special okay. basis. Okay. 
Uh, what you can do is you can simulate quantum dynamics, which has certain constraints. So let's say you want to simulate quantum dynamics, which has constraints like charge and dipole conservation, right? So these constraints can be implemented very naturally, right? So you can map product states to product states, but the mapping right. must you know, have the same charge and dipole moment, let's say, yeah? So, okay, let me let me be more specific. Is yeah. this, as this method being used for a SCARD, uh, SCARD systems? Uh, yeah, oh, well, I mean, only in the past couple of years, but yes. Uh, okay. So we use them for these fracton type. So it's useful in in that in that setup. At least for yeah, for it's useful for uh, as a, as a solvable model for constrained dynamics. Yes, okay. or or even I mean it, it's it's a model for dynamics, right? So now okay. you, know, you could consider right. So you could so again you know one way to think about this is that you have some dynamical phase, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and these automaton models sit somewhere in that dynamical phase. And this is a simulable point in that dynamical phase where you can do simulations and you can calculate things, right? Okay. And you could imagine deforming away from that point, but you know, as long as you stay in the same dynamical phase, you should expect the same universal properties. Okay. Okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, so, you know, we started off this talk by talking about stabilizer codes with Z2 conservation laws. Uh, we then moved to U1 and we got way richer behavior, you know, exact localized subspaces, exponentially large in system volume, infinitely many subdiffusive universality classes. Why don't we keep going? Why don't we go to SU2 you know, something non uh, So uh, the thing is, you know, once you go to non-abelian symmetries, the problem actually becomes over-constrained. And it's actually fairly straightforward to explain what's going on here. So now if two quantities are conserved, then their commutator is also conserved. So this is really just the Bianchi identity for commutators. Uh, so suppose you have SU2, for instance, yeah? And I say that I conserve all the charges, X, Y, Z, and I also conserve the Z component of dipole, right? Now the commutator of Z dipole on X charge better be conserved also. But the commutator of Z dipole and X charge is Y dipole. Yeah. And the commutator of Z dipole and Y charge is X dipole. So now X and Y dipole also have to be conserved. But now the commutator of X dipole and Y dipole needs to be conserved. And the commutator of X dipole and Y dipole is Z quadrupole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the commutator of X dipole and Z dipole is Y quadrupole. So now all of my quadrupoles need to be conserved and I can keep going, right? This sort of you know, iterates forever. So at the moment, if you have a like SU2 or some non some Lie algebra theory, and you impose conservation of a single dipole moment, in fact, it follows that every multiple moment of every charge must be conserved, which means you've totally trivialized the dynamics, right? The unitary is you know, completely diagonal in real space. You can give a random phase to every spin, but that's it. Uh, so U1 really is the sweet spot. Like Z2 you know, is ultimately still ergodic. SU2, you, know, you start trying to put in these higher order constraints and you, you're forced to have completely trivial dynamics. But you know, U1 actually allows for you know, some non-trivial dynamics, but also some like rich structure that's not just plain diffusion. So to summarize what I told you today, you know, fractons are a new class of states of matter. They're Characteristic property is the elementary excitations exhibit restricted mobility and they constitute a new frontier for quantum dynamics. If you start with you know, exactly solvable stabilizer codes, then ultimately things are ergodic, but the approach to equilibrium is very slow. If you promote to U1, then you get very rich behavior. So you get this ergodicity breaking via Hilbert space shattering. You have a localized subspace, which is provably localized and it's exponential in system volume. Uh, outside, no, there's also other subspaces in Hilbert space which are apparently thermal, and in those, the approach to equilibrium is subdiffusive, and there's infinitely many possible subdiffusive universality classes. We've introduced a new numerical tool to explore this kind of constrained dynamics, uh, and many of the phenomena have also been seen in experiment. Just outlook, you know, what you know, this is one set of cool stuff we found in fractons, like other, other things. Uh, other, other experimental realizations, 
besides the things we identified already? Are there alternative routes to agudicity breaking? Uh, and bottom line, you know, sort of fractons and taking inspiration from fractons, this is a wide open frontier. Uh, so I think there's much more to be found. Uh, so with that, I should thank my collaborators, in particular, Abhinav Prem, my former student, uh, postdoc at Princeton, uh, Michael Petko, my former postdoc, now at DOD, uh, Vedika Kemani at Stanford, and Andy Lucas, my colleague at Boulder. Uh, and with that, I think just about on time. Yeah, 45, perfect. Uh, so there I will conclude and I'm ready for questions. Uh, yes, uh, perfect on timing, and uh, thank you for uh, your excellent talk, uh, Professor Nand Kishore. Uh, so let us thank our speaker. And uh, questions? Uh, yeah. um, Sergey, please. Yeah, uh, simple question. What are uh, uh, physical platforms or uh, experimental realization platforms uh, which uh, will be suitable for these ideas? Well, so I gave the example of cold atoms and untilted potential. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's other examples you can come up with in synthetic matter. Uh, with, obviously, with if you had a programmable device, you could do whatever the hell you wanted. And I think with synthetic matter, you could do analog experiments. Uh, but you could say, okay, maybe that doesn't count. Yeah. Uh, so we want some solid state realization. Uh, so if we want a solid state realization, then there is, I think, basically two possibilities. Uh, so one possibility is we could look at elasticity theory. So my colleague, Leora Zuhovsky, has pointed out uh, that the you know, quantum theory of elasticity is actually dual to fracton theory or to certain fracton theories with or disclinations and dislocations playing the role of excitations with restricted mobility. Yeah. Uh, so one thing we could certainly do is we could like try and, but okay, well, we've known about elasticity theory forever and ever. So you know, I think the aim of the game would be to learn something new about elasticity theory by exploiting this duality of fractions. And the other possibility is we could look in frustrated magnets. Uh, so we could view these systems as a sort of extra exotic version of quantum spin liquid. Uh, so you, like, at least in principle, you can have quantum spin liquids which have emergent gauge fields, like emergent vector gauge fields. That's well established, I think, you know, for at least for 20 years now. And we can view these fracton type systems as a more exotic type of quantum spin liquid uh, where the uh, emergent gauge fields are now you know, higher rank objects. So they're symmetric tensors or something. Uh, so yeah, uh, back maybe to, to the cold atoms which you mentioned at the beginning. Um, yeah. uh, well, if, if we go away from the uh, the one example of uh, yeah. of, uh, of uh, tilting or DC yeah. fields, what would be other uh, more or less reasonable ways to? Yeah. Well, okay. You could consider cold atoms in a strong harmonic trap, uh, and those uh, so there the trap potential will couple to the quadrupole. So that's a way of introducing quadrupole conservation. Uh, you could consider fluids in a strong magnetic field, which also has the effect of quenching dipole. Uh, so those are the three examples I know of. Thank you. Any further questions from the audience? It seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank our speaker again. Thank you for the and uh, with this, uh, we conclude our today's seminar. So thank you all for participating. And whoever is interested in uh, informal discussion, uh, please uh, stick around.